It's Friday the 19th of November. European stocks are down again and are actually heading for a negative week. The countdown to the close starts right now. The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. So as we head into the Friday close, what do you need to know about the market action that we're seeing over here in Europe? Negative is the main story. You're seeing a sea of red across the European continent. Uh, the, the driver of this is, of course, what is happening in places like Austria uh, and Germany. Uh, as we watch the Austrian index down by 3.2%. 3 Germany's down by half of 1%, but Austria is the epicenter of the action right now uh, as we see a lockdown being imposed there and talk that Germany could follow. Where else could be on the list? The IBEX is down by 1.8% at the moment. The UK down by around half of 1%. Broadly, though, the stock 600, after peaking midweek, Alex, looks like it's going to have a negative close on the week. It's going to be a really tight call. We'll check it in 30 minutes as we get into the close. Yeah, volume pretty solid over in Europe as well as here in the U.S., it's a negative day uh, for some equity markets. Uh, S&P uh, Energy is off 3.5%. Exxon having a huge gap down as you have oil really falling out of bed. Part of that is definitely the lockdowns over in Europe. Are we going to have a mobility issue yet again? So that's the downside. Plus side, you get Nasdaq 100 at 5 tenths of 1%. But as I mentioned earlier, if you take away stuff like Apple and Tesla, Things aren't that looking that great, even for the, lar for the large cap tech stocks. Now, you did have Chris Waller about 15 minutes ago making a speech to the Fed governor uh, talking about the fact that the labor market could recover sooner than we think. So we could see rate hikes in 2022. So you're seeing yields that were down by about five or six basis points, pairing some of those losses off the lows of the session. Now, what's helping the S&P stay, stay stable in some capacity is going to be Pfizer up by just five tenths of 1%. Moderna, also one of the best performing stocks after they got the FDA approval for boosters for all adults here in the U.S. We're talking boosters. Guy over there, you're talking lockdowns. Well, boosters, lockdowns, vaccinations, in many ways, unfortunately, the vaccination story probably has been overtaken by the case count. That's the problem right now. You can't vaccinate quickly, uh, quick enough anymore because the rate of change, the delta, is picking up so quickly. And that's the problem that places like Austria and Germany are now facing. Germany no longer dismissing the possibility of a no national lockdown. Uh, Lothar Wieler, uh, the head of Germany's public health authority, the RKI, talking about this earlier, sounding the alarm on this really sort of huge pickup that we're seeing. All of Germany is one big outbreak. This is a nationwide state of emergency. We need to pull the emergency break. So you can look at this a number of ways. You can look at what's happening in Germany and compare it with the UK at a headline level, i.e. the number of cases that we're seeing. You can go over here. I'll get the camera around to come and sort of follow me over. So the UK is up here. That's the blue line. Germany is rapidly approaching the UK. But that's not the point. As I mentioned, it's about the rate of change. The UK has been up here for a while and is relatively stable and seems to be coping. The rate of change in Germany and Austria and lots of other countries that has suddenly really picked up. And that, I think, is where the cause for concern is, Alex. Mm -hmm. It's not about the actual case count. It's how quickly they're picking up. Yep. And vaccinations at that point won't matter. Now this is sort of what happens over the next few months. Uh, Rasmus Beck Hansen is Airfinity's CEO. Airfinity is an analytics and data company. It's been tracking virus trends and vaccinations. Rasmus, thanks for joining us. Um, if Austria is going to go into lockdown, what country is next? What does the case count look to you? Well, I think I think we're seeing the fourth wave of COVID really hitting hard. I would say almost everywhere you look, you're seeing increased numbers. Even in the U.S., you're seeing a little bit of an increase. And even in the U.K., of course, more steady, as you point out, also starting over the last couple of days to see an increase. But, but the one to watch, I agree, is really Germany, because Germany is in a very similar position to Austria. It has, hasn't had the same vaccination uptake as some of the other countries, around 75% of the population, around the same as Austria, where we have other countries have had 90, almost like 95. So Germany is less protected and facing a more, therefore a more difficult situation. And the rate of change is now 
above the it's really exponential above the 50 percent uh, week on week so eventually you know the big question is is there anything else they can do in germany than impose a strict up maybe full lockdown as we see almost in in austria yeah. or at least partial I, th I think germany's problem though is that it's a federal state right so even if they decide things it needs to be decided also at the local state level and we've seen that previous in the pandemic that's harder for them to do than for instance in austria why has the UK been able to manage to develop a reasonably stable strategy where the others are suddenly seeing this huge pickup? What, can you compare and contrast what has happened in the UK versus, say, Germany or Austria? Well, so, yeah, so that, that's a good point. I think UK, UK has higher vaccinations, so higher general level of protections. But then I think also UK, we, we are seeing high, fairly high mortality numbers, caseloads, etc. So it's also ultimately a question of what, what level do we uh, accept. But I think what happened in the, the UK, the Delta hit earlier. They hit already in the summertime. And maybe that was somewhat of a blessing because there we had like higher temperatures, less indoor, etc. So in that way, you, it was a better place, a better time to cope for 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 the UK. Uh, where now in the winter there is less uh, less less uh, the countries can do. So I think that's part of it. But it's also mainly also a political decision. What's the political support for? It is a trade-off. Are we protecting people from getting uh, infected? Are we keeping our economy open? What what do we do there? And there I think UK has now politically decided that we're going to accept a, a higher. Uh, in, uh, ongoing infection numbers um, and hospitalization number that some of the other countries might be able, uh, willing mm -hmm. to accept. Hey, uh, Rasmus, throughout the whole pandemic, the U.S. has been somewhere around six weeks uh, behind waves that we've seen in Europe. Is the six week uh, is the U.S. six weeks behind this one? I, I think we're going to see a definitely seven, especially in the northern states of U.S., we're also going to see a, a spike. We were always concerned going into the winter, November, December, January, that that's going to be the difficult time for European and U.S. Um, and, and, you know, I don't see any signs that that's that not happening. It's, it is likely we'll see continued increase. And, and as you point out, yes, yes, we're getting boosters. Yes, we're getting vaccinations. We also have better medicine, et cetera. But if you're seeing an exponential growth rate, the only real measure is a, a non-medical interventions like a, a full of a partial lockdowns. And I think some of the uh, policies we are now seeing is quite yeah. dramatic. We're kind of, yeah. If Germany doesn't take the decision that Austria has made, how high could the numbers get? Can you extrapolate? Yeah, well, it, it's hard to say. But it's basically a bet on whether it levels out. Because if you look at the UK, what, what actually happened to some extent is it started to level level off at, at one point, right? So it could, um, that's the big question. If it goes exponential, will it continue to go exponential? Or should we take the chance that it might level up naturally, as somewhat the UK does? But that's my point, that that was an easier decision to make in the in the summertime. I think it's more dangerous to make, uh, to bet on that in, in, the, in the winter. So, so so I think it could go as high as, as the previous lockdown numbers um, oh. because we, the, the key problem we have, even the protected part, the vaccinated part, they can still transmit. So we'll kind of continue to go. And ultimately, even if you are vaccinated, you are at risk at uh, developing symptomatic uh, disease, right? So um, it, it could go much uh, significantly, much, much higher than it is now. Wow, Rasmus, thanks a lot. We appreciate that. Rasmus Beck Hansen, Airfinity CEO, a really interesting modeling there. Want to bring in Banu Baweja, UBS chief strategist. Banu, do we need to position again for a new round of lockdowns this winter? Um, I don't think the market's going to do that uh, because, look, uh, you, of course, you're seeing cases in some ca in, in some cases you're seeing them 1.5 times higher than the previous peak. But when you look at hospitalizations, they're somewhere between a third and 40 percent of what they were pre-vaccination drive. So uh, I don't think the market said also because we've seen this many times that you know you get through that the stock market goes down and then it rebounds to higher levels. Um, there is also the other issue that we need to bear in mind that some of the bottlenecks that we had in the economy that were actually keeping growth much lower. German industrial production, for instance, 16 percentage points below that of Italian industrial production since last year because of the shortages of chips. Some of these um, shortages are actually coming through and, and uh, you're seeing easing coming through. So you will actually see a pretty big increase in production towards orders. So I think as long as hospitalizations are low, and again, this is not a question of financial market, it's a question of, of science. Uh, I, I do think that the markets will look through that.
and focus on things like uh, improving production in Sweden, in Germany, in Japan, in Mexico, the auto rebound, I think, is going to be a massive rebound. Yeah. I think that's where the markets are going to focus in the medium term. Does that, does that still apply if we get lockdowns? If you were to put Germany into lockdown, does that thesis still hold up? Um, look, I mean, if there's one or two countries, I mean, Latvia is probably even even further ahead in terms of hospitalizations. If, if it's just one or two countries, and I can see that Germany is by far the most important one. If you go into an, a protracted lockdown, I, that thesis will not apply. But if you go into a selective and short lockdown, I, I think that thesis will still apply. The markets will look through that. Uh, Banu, if you take a look at what's happening in the market, we're finally starting to price in a little bit of COVID fear, right? Um, is that a buying opportunity then? Um, I think for the next three months, it is going to be a buying opportunity. When you look further out, look, um, with or without COVID, earnings momentum is probably going to slip towards close to zero in Q2, around Q3 of next year. At the same time, liquidity is going to be withdrawn, right? Through the course of this, li this year, liquidity has actually become more easily available. Real interest rates have dropped. Credit spreads have dropped. So from a financial and monetary conditions perspective, this has been an easing year, even though, even though growth has improved next year, the growth liquidity mix deteriorates. So I think that will be a buying opportunity through till about Q2. We think the markets put in a peak in Q2. That's not because of lockdowns or because of COVID, but because of exhaustion of uh, earnings momentum, which is more organic. Uh, you go towards trend in the face of tightening liquidity. Not necessarily the Fed at the front end, but the 10-year real rate is one of the most mispriced assets out there. And that's the risk rate of the world. So in a CAPM model sense, if the risk-free rate moves, then every risk yeah. asset moves, and we think the 10-year real rate goes higher. Just give me a sense of, of uh, again, we're talking about rate of change. How quickly could that happen, that repricing? Plenty. Yeah, that's a very important point, Guy, right? Because this year we've seen such a large technical, the demand for tips has been so high, the supply has been so limited. When the second derivative of CPI peaks, which is going to be around February, March, you could see a pretty rapid change in, in real yield. So I think between Q1 and Q2 of next year, you could see as much as 50 to 70 basis points. And through a 12-month period, we're actually thinking 100 basis points higher in U.S. 10-year real yields. Hmm. Okay, that, that is significant and, and will have lasting effects. Barney, stick around. I want to talk about as well what's happening with the euro right now. Dollar strength, certainly a theme that has been present this week, the question is, how long does it stick around for and what are the opportunities around that? Barney's going to stick around. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. We do not take this phase of higher inflation lightly. We are committed to ensuring that inflation stabilizes at our 2% target in the medium term. Today, inflation is largely being pushed up by the exceptional circumstances created by the pandemic. That was, of course, the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, speaking earlier at the European Banking Congress that took place in Frankfurt. Barnu Bouazia of UBS still with us. Barnu, we've come down pretty sharply. We're below 113. People are talking about 110. Would you chase your dollar down to 110? No, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't because, uh, look, there is a big risk that you go uh, for serious lockdowns all across Europe. In that case, I think you will have Euribor coming in and you will have Euro going down. But if we were, our base case, if we were to avoid that lockdown, um, as I said earlier, I think the, the event that we want to be looking for is a significant pickup in Japanese industrial production, in German industrial production, and across Europe, you know, places that have really suffered from supply lockdowns, particularly of chips, that really catch up in the next three to four months. So I think there could be a tactical rebound in the euro. I don't think it makes a lot of sense chasing it lower out here. Medium term, there are bigger headwinds building for the euro, not least from ECB's communication challenge, which is going to be huge because damned if they do, damned if they're not. If mm -hmm. they don't, inflation on the one side, BTP spreads on the other side. There's some real serious medium term challenges. But here, I think cyclically, I don't want to be selling the euro at all, neither European stocks. So then how do you play the policy divergence then? So traders are basically now uh, priced out rate hikes for 2022 for the ECB. We're even coming off that a little bit uh, for the U.S. as well. But there's clearly going to be a divergence. Why do you not play that or how do you play that then? 
Yeah, so do you know what's really interesting this year is that European inflation swaps have actually done 55 basis points. I'm talking about five-year, five-year, 55 basis points more than the U.S. has. And that doesn't make any sense if you think U.S. is sort of going to burn in inflation and European uh, economy is still going to be reasonably lukewarm. So I think one of the ways to play that is to receive European inflation relative to U.S. inflation. So that's, that's one way to think about it. But the other way to think about it is not just in terms of policy divergence, Alex. You've got to think about it in terms of who is most vulnerable to U.S. real rates going up. And that's not the euro. That's emerging markets. And in fact, if you think of that in a Venn diagram sense, you want to be thinking about places that are in the, in the intersection of base metals hit from China, because that's where growth is extremely slow as well, and higher U.S. real rates. And that takes you to Brazil, it takes you to South Africa, that takes you to Indonesia. These are some of the places in emerging markets where we think that's the most elegant way to be long dollars against these guys rather than be long dollars yeah. against stocky or against euro or against yen. I want to come back and talk EM just in just a moment, a little bit more detail, but just sticking with Europe for the moment. In terms of the impact that a rebound in the euro would have, where does that take me? Does it take me back to the cyclical domestic rebound story? Does it? I, you would have thought that the exporters would be benefiting. We were talking about this earlier, kind of 112, 113. Just kind of walk me through how that changes my, my sort of tactical approach to investing in European stocks. Well, if, if you do get a 300, 400 basis points uh, um, pips rebound in the euro, I don't think that will fundamentally take you away from cyclicals towards defensives or momentum towards quality. I think European exporters will continue to do well because global trade is, is very strong and therefore cap goods and exporters in, in general will continue to do well, even though the second derivative of that is going to be coming negative. The first derivative is just so strong for the next six months. I think they will continue to do well. The other area which I think will do well is because this is going to be a time, lockdowns permitting, this is going to be a time of rising real yields. Financials which have been stopping and stopping I think European financials over the next three to four months are a, are a pretty decent trade. But once again, we think this momentum, this is a trade. The value trade is a trade. The European equities are a trade in Q2 of next year as earnings momentum comes down and U.S. real yields are going higher. The yep. growth liquidity mix changes. We think that's when the markets uh, in equities, both in U.S. and Europe, top out. And you probably switch back to the U.S. at that point for, to play defense. I was going to ask, if you want to play defense, you switch back to the U.S. Where in the U.S.? A growth, right? Because we, we want to move away from value at that time. You want to move away from momentum at that time. You want to move towards growth and quality. So we think on a 12-month horizon, growth will once again, and it has done this year as well, which is bizarre because this has been such a reflationary year, growth has actually marginally outperformed value in MSCI world and in the U.S. in particular. And I think the same playbook is going to apply on a 12-month basis, perhaps not on a three-month basis, but on a 12-month basis. We go back to growth. We go back to uh, quality in the U.S. That's where the earnings are going to compound at the fastest pace. Okay. Just, just a final, I, I mentioned EM, you mentioned EM, so let's just talk about it a little bit. Um, that's where your kind of heritage and history lies in terms of your experience working through the numbers, figuring out exactly what has happened. Talk to me a little bit about why, why EM has underperformed. Bonnie, you've been an, an EM specialist for most of your career. Have you been surprised that we haven't seen EM doing better in this environment? Look, I, I find myself on the, uh, and, and I have found for the better part of the last 10 years, myself on the more bearish end of the EM spectrum because I think globalization peaked in 2007 and that was a fundamental change in EM earnings trajectory, growth trajectory, FX trajectory, and so on. But given the degree of tailwinds that EM has had, lower real yields, higher commodity prices, very strong global trade, tighter credit spreads, you would have thought that EM would do better. But the single most important variable that hasn't favored EM is that developed markets have done even better. So EM, DM growth differentials is the one thing that matters to bring capital flows into EM. So, and when DM is doing this well, when US is analyzing 7%, Europe is analyzing 6% growth, it isn't enough for China to give you 5% growth or Brazil to give you 6% growth. That opportunity cost is just way too high, and that's why people remain invested in earnings they can trust. And I'm afraid the same thing is going to happen next year. The EMDM growth differential is actually going to move in favor of DM rather than EM, plus um, the headwinds for EM are going to increase. Higher real yields, weaker global trade. These are some of the headwinds that are going to start increasing. So we expect another year of underperformance from uh, EM equities, also from EMFX, 
EM rates have blown up so much that there will be very interesting opportunities within the rate space. So you have to differentiate across asset classes. But I can't say that we are sort of holding our breath for a renaissance across EM in all asset classes. So you really painted a stark picture of the next 6 to 12 months in terms of the trade and what happens. What kind of volatility do you think we're going to see within that? And where do we see the volatility? It's been in the bond market. Does it spread? Where does it go? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, impressive, right? Because you think of swaption wall, bond wall is sort of as the mother wall and a sufficient condition for wall and other asset classes to pick up. And it hasn't. And I think the reason it hasn't, Alex, is that you, you still haven't seen significant sort of divergence of growth trends across different regions, right? Uh, growth picking up in EM, improving in Europe, very strong in the US. But it's when you start to see that divergence, when domestic demand in Europe slows down, when domestic demand in EM begins to slow down and global trade slows down, that's when I think people will think about US exceptionalism once again. I personally think that's a, that's a Q2 and H2 thing. So once you get through the big synchronized rebound in Q1, I think that's when vol picks up. And, 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 and the place where vol remains extremely low uh, is is uh, both equities and FX actually, but particularly FX. And I think positioning for defense yeah. through FX vol makes a lot of sense right now. Hey, Bono, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bono Baweja of UBS. Good to see you. This is Bloomberg. Now for Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Alex Steele. Ryanair is dropping the listing on the London Stock Exchange over Brexit compliance hassles. Europe's largest low-cost airline has had to limit some stock purchases to ensure it's controlled from within the EU. Trading volumes in London now have dwindled, but Ryanair hasn't managed to steer enough activity to its main listing in Dublin. And a big change underway in the once austere city of London, the financial district. Now, bankers are coming back to work, but their suits are at home. Instead, they're going to tailors to make them bespoke khaki pants and casual jackets. And they're even putting on brown shoes, ignoring the old London edict, never wear brown in town. And that is the latest business flash. Guy, will you partake in this? Uh, well, I'm wearing black shoes right now. Sticking to the old adage, uh, when you're in the country, it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever you want. But in town, never wear brand shoes. It used to be the way that it went. It was a huge fashion faux pas. But look, the lockdown has changed everything. You don't see that many people walking around in suits anymore. There does yeah. seem to be a kind of, you, you, can, you can wear whatever you want as long as you're not seeing clients, seems to be the narrative. Scoots. They're called a little scoots. little smart with some scoots, yeah. <laughs> Like it. Anyway, I've still got to wear a suit. I can't see the powers that be here changing that anytime soon. Anyway, the European close is next. This is Bloomberg. So we're wrapping up the session. We're wrapping up the week for European equities. Counting you down to the close. Let's talk about what has been going on because today's news flow has been dominated by one story and that is the lockdown in Austria sending shockwaves across the rest of the continent could Germany be next that is why you're seeing so much selling here in Europe and and it is focused and it is localized around the key areas so Austria the Austrian market Vienna down by over 3% today under real pressure. The banks in particular, I'll show you Raffheisen in just a moment, really coming down. But there's Austria, as you can see, the ATX down by 3.1%. Now, broadly across Europe, we are seeing losses as well. Germany's down by two tenths, three tenths. The CAC's down by three tenths. The London market down by four tenths of 1%. So you are seeing localised selling. The IBEX, though, is interesting. The Spanish market down by one and a half percent. Let's talk about the, the week that we've had, just to give you an idea of the context and how this has really turned things around over the last couple of days. We hit peaks earlier on in the week, uh, just north of 490. We've given that back. We're at 486 right now. But on the week, we are basically flat. This week has been a round trip 
for the stock 600. Key markets, though, are in focus that are influencing all of this, too. I want to talk about Brent. I want to talk about Euro dollar. I want to be talking about what's happening with the Bund rate. Uh, Bund's a bid. Brent is not. As you can see, crude down by 3.5%. That's good news for the President of the United States, who has been so concerned. Maybe this diffuses the idea that we see an SPR release uh, to ease gas prices in the United States. But the other story that's been in focus, and it's linked to the COVID story, but it's also linked to the rate differential story, has been Euro dollar. We've been below 113. Today we're down trading 113.18. I say we've been below it this week. Uh, today we're kind of trading around 113, down by around half of 1%. But Bund's a bid. It's going to be interesting to see how core periphery works in this kind of environment. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening with the stock 600, how the sector story has broken down. This is the one-day story. Unsurprisingly, I'm going to focus at the bottom here. Energy, banks, travel and leisure is where we've seen the real weakness coming through. And you can see that in the individual stocks that we've been talking about. The stay-at-home stocks are starting to catch a bit again. The banks in places like Austria are very much under pressure. IAG, the airline stock, and I, could, you could, I, I just picked IAG randomly. There are plenty of others that are really feeling the pressure today. So there's Just Eat up by 6.21%. We're back talking about stay-at-home stocks. We're back focusing on where they could be adding value. So Just Eat up by 6.21%. Raffheisen Bank, one of the biggest in Austria, down by nearly 7%, 6.8%. The airline stocks, they could certainly feel the pressure from this. Oil's better. Lockdown not. IAG down by three and a half percent, Alex. Yeah, we just thought that this year was next year was going to really be about how good could it get for these guys. Really changed the narrative quite quickly, it seems. Bloomberg's Christopher Jasper uh, joins us now. He helps lead the coverage uh, over in Europe that covers the transportation sector. Um, how bad can it get for the airline stocks? Well, it's certainly been a, a, a shock today, uh, a real shock to the system. Um, the reality is for airlines that they're always in the firing line. They, they, they tend to be the most sensitive shocks, uh, stocks to any sort of reversal. So the, the sort of surprise of the extremity of the action in Austria and the possibility of Germany to follow with a lockdown uh, has really set them back at a point when most airlines were really looking forward to a pretty positive Christmas period and then to a really healthy uh, rebound next year. Certainly for the past few weeks, all the talk has been of optimism, of a strong rebound in traffic, um, and, and, and of, you know, just how big the profits are going to be next year, because, because airlines have been getting pretty close to break even. And this has really sort of dented that, that confidence, uh, as you can see from the share yeah. declines. Chris, one of the things is, though, that the winter is less important. I appreciate that we don't know what's going to happen with ski seasons. Obviously, Austria uh, is pivotal to that. Um, but these airlines really make their money in the summer. To what extent can they manage a short-term lockdown? A, a lot of the carriers will idle aircraft during this period anyway. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and there's been a bit of a... I mean, I think the, the other concern here... Uh, there's certainly an immediate concern about the lockdown... But we had a, a downgrade of uh, IAG stock today by Exane, uh, who advanced the concern that the optimism generally may be overdone and that there is rank over capacity pouring back into the market um, at a time when you might have thought emerging from the pandemic there would be capacity discipline like we've never seen before. In fact, airlines are rushing back. They're desperate to, to get the, the cash rolling back in. Uh, and it seems that there is certainly overcapacity in Europe, led by carriers like Ryanair and Wizz. Uh, Wizz was down, fell more than 4% today, I think. There's also concern about the North Atlantic, that there's a lot of capacity rolling back in there. It's only just reopened. We've not really seen the figures come through yet, so we don't know uh, exactly how much capacity the transatlantic can support. Uh, but we, it may be the case that we've had sort of a quick rush back from those people who were desperate to, to sort of see family and friends on, uh, you know, either side of the Atlantic. And also in Europe, we, we've had people taking a late holiday in October. But yeah. if that capacity is back in the market, then it could persist into next year. So, Chris, um, we were kind of prepping for Guy to come here and visit the team. And now I feel like that could definitely be off, uh, off the radar. Does the North Atlantic, uh, transatlantic route stay open altogether? Well, I mean, that's, that, that's another question. I mean, if, um, if infection rates are climbing in Europe, if we're getting, uh, 
you know, the, the, the return of the lockdown, then the U.S. has only just reopened. Um, it, it did previously take a sort of one-size-fits-all view of Europe and, and, and indeed the rest of the world and, and, and uh, uh, re resisted allowing people in for, for quite a long time. I mean, in the U.K., we've got a, a rather different position to Austria and Germany. In, infection rates uh, are very low, um, and the UK is beginning to roll out uh, further vaccinations. So it seems unlikely that there'll be uh, a major surge in infection here. But nevertheless, a UK-based company, IAG, parent of British Airways, uh, you, you know, is, is under pressure. Um, so we, it, it is, as Guy says, this is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction today, perhaps, to the news that we've seen. But there is... A, a wider concern. I mean, for example, the corporate markets on which IAG is so dependent, will they come back? Um, will companies allow people, you know, from the rest of the world to travel into Europe? Uh, yeah. Well, that, that's going to be the critical question. As Alex says, I was hoping to go across the Atlantic, but big corporates, so I was talking to Shai about this the other day uh, at Virgin, Shai Weiss. He was saying it's big corporates that are being the most hesitant right now. Smaller companies are willing to take the risk. Larger companies, bigger HR departments, maybe being a bit more cautious. Chris, thanks very much indeed. Enjoy the weekend. Christopher Jasper from our transport team talking about what's happening with the airline uh, numbers today. Alex, we're just getting numbers coming through from Italy. Actually, the, the COVID case numbers look fairly stable. Um, and actually, the death rate day before versus the day before has come down. Uh, but people are, are watching Italy very careful. Obviously, northern Italy, close proximity uh, to, to Austria, Switzerland, etc. It'll be interesting to see what happens when, when you, you start to see sort of continuing migration across those borders and whether or not you see northern Italy seeing a pickup in the case count too. Especially because um, so southern Italy, as well as like Spain and Portugal, right, the vaccination rates are, are, are pretty good in comparison to Germany, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So um, does that, is that enough to sort of fend off any kind of spread um, or do you see breakthrough infections, et cetera, or do boosters need to but, catch up? I think will also be very interesting. Yeah, but like northern Italy, Alps, it gets cold, people go mm -hmm. inside. That's the difference as well, and they go inside a lot earlier. So maybe that's also some of the commonality that we're going to see here, which is as it gets colder and it's started to get colder across Europe, we are seeing people going back inside, and that's obviously a factor behind some of these cases that are picking up. Um, we've wrapped up the European session. We've got the final numbers here in Europe, just to give you an idea of what they look like. We have largely seen a negative week, uh, but only just uh, when it comes to these markets. Uh, but those are the final numbers. Main markets down by around half of 1%. Austria down by 3% today. Alex? All right, well, coming up, another piece of data that we got uh, is retail sales out of the UK. Consumers definitely spending, ticking off some of their Christmas lists pretty early, driving a rebound in those retail sales. Stacey Widlitz, uh, SW Retail Advisors president, will join us with a closer look at those numbers. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, the European closer, looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Richard Johnson, Foot Locker CEO at 4 p.m. New York, 9 p.m. in London. Don't miss that conversation. This is Bloomberg. So have you done your Christmas shopping yet? It seems that many people have. Everybody seems to have been worried about all the headlines of shortages and inflation, and it spooked everybody. And as a result of which, we are seeing a turnaround in UK retail sales. So for the first time since April, UK retail sales have risen month on month. Now, that's ended the longest ever run of declines. We have become a nation of shoppers rather than shopkeepers. Joining us now, Stacey Woodlitz, SW Retail Advisors President. Stacey, are the consumers doing the right thing here? in terms of front-running Christmas because they're worried about shortages? Well, the headlines have done their job. All of the supply chain fears have done their job because they're pushing consumers into the stores earlier than last year. And that's true for the UK and it's true for the US. So consumers are concerned, particularly in toys, sporting goods, footwear, that there's not going to be enough. And they're correct because for so many of the retailers, they're talking about up to half of their product coming in late for fall and Christmas. Um, what are people actually buying right now? 
you know, the, some of the apparel numbers were actually pretty encouraging. We're only down about 5% pre, from pre-pandemic in the UK. So that's really encouraging. Sporting goods, very strong. Um, toys are starting, you know, to fly off the shelves. So I think it's a mixture of outdoor stuff for our, our new lifestyles. And of course, um, you know, getting those toys before they sell out those hot toys. And of course, people in the UK are dining out again, those numbers up versus pre-pandemic for seated diners. And if you've been out in London, you've seen it. It's pretty busy out there. It's going to be really busy out there tonight, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> Stacey, do, do you expect the next month numbers to look pretty good? But what does it look like after Christmas? Yeah, so I think what we've seen is somewhat of a pull forward. And by the way, everybody's talking about um, Black Friday, just right around the corner. And it's yep. definitely going to be smaller this year and not the deal's not as great. But guess what? It started a month ago, just like usual. So a combination of those promotions early, which were somewhat unexpected, plus the headlines, perhaps pulled it forward. And also we're going to have inventory shortages as we get toward Christmas. So maybe kind of like a peak and then a... A, a, a thud a bit and of course we have to worry about next year when supply chain gets back into shape do retails over order and do we get back into the over inventory position again yeah i feel like a lot of black friday deals right now are free shipping i feel like that's what i'm seeing uh, rather than like the here's your 80 percent discount kind of thing um hey stacy here in the u.s we saw consumer sentiment really roll over as inflation expectations moved higher but retail sales held up is it a say can it continue on that trajectory? And is it the same over in the UK? Yeah, so in the US, we just had, we heard from Macy's and Kohl's and Target and incredible numbers, blew away all expectations. It is very clear that consumers out there, again, perhaps some pull forward. Um, but, you know, let's face it, we haven't really had a full on holiday in two years. So everybody's really pushing it and getting in the spirit. And again, in the UK, I think the patterns are very similar. But one thing that we're seeing in both locations and globally is that full price selling is the story here. So generally, yeah. discounts are down because inventory is down so much. Well, OK, let's just pick up on that inventory. One of the key things that retailers have got to get right these days is returns. Who's managing returns properly? Who's managing their inventory? Because if inventory is limited, you want to manage that really, really carefully. So I think what you've seen is, I guess, during COVID and two years later, what we've seen is the big guys are winning. Why? Target, Walmart, Costco, they have the power to lock up supply really early and squeeze out a lot of the mid-tier guys. So they're winning. Just about everybody's complaining about shortages of inventories, except Target and Walmart are saying, hey, we feel pretty good because they're getting a lot of the stock. Some of these companies are getting their own ships to bring stuff in. So it's kind of the good, the big guys winning and the smaller guys getting squeezed out. Um, but in certain sectors like footwear, you know, there's just not enough to go around. But Stacey, what's interesting with Walmart and Target, I mean, you're right in terms of the sales, but their margins, the market did not like what they were seeing with their margins. True, and you know, Target's had two years of increasing margins while everybody else has kind of been behind them a bit. So there is a fear out there about cost, right? Because everybody's having to ship things expedited to get it on time. They're trying to push things to happen quicker in terms of delivery when we know there's such log jams out yeah. there. To me, that's, you know, that will play itself out in four quarters, six quarters, whatever it is. I think the thing to focus on is that Target's in-store comparable sales are up 20% on a two-year basis. That's where the customer is going. One final quick question for me, Stacey. We're seeing lockdowns starting to be reimposed in continental Europe. Today it was Austria, tomorrow it could be Germany. I, this presumably couldn't come at a worse time for German retailers. I appreciate Germany and retailing don't necessarily always go together in the same sentence. But, but nevertheless, if we do see lockdowns, how hard will that hit the retailers in this critical run-up to Christmas? Yeah, I think we're all having a little bit of deja vu. You know, Christmas around the corner and we're getting locked down again. And Germany is the biggest apparel market in Europe, so it is, it is incredibly important. And I think that's that's a risk here. It's a short-term risk. And if you think about Hugo Boss, 60% of sales in Europe, heavy Germany, H&M, Germany's their top market. 
PVH has real exposure to, to Germany and to Europe in general. So for a lot of these stocks, you're going to see volatility again. And if there are true lockdowns, you're going to see some inventory being pushed and marked down as we go into Q1 for sure. All right, Stacey, thanks a lot. We super appreciate it. Happy holidays, Stacey Woodlitz. Good to see you. Happy Retail holidays. <laughs> you too. At a Retail Advisors President, thank you so very much. All right, coming up, will he or will he not reappoint Fed Chair Dave Powell? It's the question we keep asking and the one we really want to answer. The White House says President Biden will announce the decision now before the Thanksgiving holiday. We'll break that down next. This is Bloomberg. From London, I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele. Over in New York, this is the European Close on Bloomberg Markets. Alex, uh, let's turn our attention to what is happening. We're about, what, um, an hour or so into U.S. trading, about two and a half hours and into and the half. U.S. trading day. <laughs> that would probably be a better way of looking at it. We've been on air for, yeah, two hours, so <laughs> add a half hour, two and a half hours. I should probably just read what's in front of me rather than looking bit, at the clock and trying to do the yep. maths. Yep. Critty. Save me. What's going on? <laughs> Guy, I will save you. Uh, we'll start off with semiconductors because they are having a little bit of a mixed story today. You have the Sox index up about half a percent, but you don't see more gains because it's a mixed story under the hood. We'll start here with Micron, a 7.6 percent rise. It's, of course, coming after the CEO was at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum and said the chip shortage, well, it's easing, but it's still persisting, but getting a little bit better. You do have the same story with NVIDIA. Another day of gains. A lot of that has to do uh, with potentially nearing a $1 trillion market cap. This key for NVIDIA has to to be about diversification. That's exactly what Applied Materials did not do, still dealing with those supply chain crunches. Some good news, though, over in the vaccine makers, Moderna and Pfizer both getting regulatory approval. Moderna for its COVID booster, Pfizer for its vaccine broadly, and you can really see Moderna up 4.1%. But to the downside, you ha do have those travel stocks when it comes to those airlines, to those cruise lines, essentially those volatility plays not doing well. This has everything to do with Austria going into lockdown and Germany saying, well, that's an option that is still on the table. All right, Kriti, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta joining us there. At the same time, investors still awaiting President Biden's decision on whether he'll renominate Fed Chair Jay Powell. Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, has been following the dragged out decision. Um, and now it feels like, you know, Manchin's weighing in on who's he going to meet with, who does he like, etc. This is the uh, third or fourth day of the four days, depending on whether you count the weekend. And so we are expecting the president to do something soon. He told us that. And we have obtained pictures of the two he's going to nominate in the Rose Garden this afternoon. <laughs> we'll show you here. That's peanut butter and jelly. Those are the turkeys. Aww. This will not translate at all to no. Guy in London. The turkeys that uh, Biden will pardon in the Rose Garden this afternoon, they are not the new Fed chairs. Wait, he does two or one? Uh, he does two. Oh, I thought he just uh, did the one. Well, okay. we'll see. I mean, generally, I think both of them are going to... I mean, how would you choose? Uh, anyway... <laughs> <laughs> That's about as much as we know about what the president is going to do. He is still keeping mum on who he is going to appoint. And as uh, Alex said, uh, it is uh, Joe Manchin who is sort of making some headlines by saying he's going to meet with Lael Brainerd after meeting with Joe Biden and then meet with maybe Joe yeah. Biden again. So we're not exactly sure who's in the, f <laughs> the lead at this point, Guy. Um, yeah, I'm starting to wonder who's going to make this call. I, is it going to be the president's? Uh, or is it going to be Senator Manchin? I, it does sound as if it's increasingly going to be Senator Manchin that ultimately makes the call. Or Warren. Um, well, it's, oh, it, it, it was interesting. Elizabeth, I, think, I think Elizabeth Warren has already made her decision, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, she and uh, two Democrats, Jeff Merkley and Sheldon Whitehouse, came out today against Powell, saying uh, he wasn't going to do enough on climate change, although they don't say what he should be doing, and Powell has said that the Fed will act to uh, make sure that banks are making safe loans. So uh, but not clear exactly what the Senate is going to end up saying about either one of these, but perhaps the yep. idea that Brainerd was leaked as a potential competitor to Powell was a trial balloon to get these people to react. They certainly have. Mike, it's been a, a fascinating week, a long week waiting for the final answer. But hopefully, maybe over the next couple of days, we'll get it. I appreciate the president a little uh, um, sort of focused elsewhere today, maybe. Tomorrow's his birthday. Maybe the beginning of next week. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Anyway, Mike, I'm sure you'll be uh, keeping abreast of things over the weekend. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Mike McKee. Uh, talking of next week, what do we have 
coming up next week. But let's start with Monday. That seems appropriate, doesn't it? US existing home sales. Zoom is reporting number. Maybe it'll be back in fashion as we see lockdowns coming back. Uh, US trade rep Catherine Tai will be in India for trade talks appropriately again. Tuesday, manufacturing services and composite PMI data for the United States, France, Germany and the Eurozone. Also earnings, what have we got? Dollar Tree, Gap and Dell. Yeah, Gap already had a nice run uh, off the likes of Macy's earlier this week. So Wednesday, ton of economic data, jobless claims, GDP, UMICH sentiment, new home sales, plus Deere reports earnings for the first time since that worker strike ended, and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand makes their rate decision. Uh, and remember, Thursday, the U.S. markets are closed for Thanksgiving Friday, and Black Friday, they also are closed for about a half day as well. So that's going to be uh, fun as well. That wraps it up for me and Guy on This Week on Television. Coming up on Balance of Power with David Weston, uh, Dr. Stephen Corwin, New York Presbyterian Hospital CEO, will be joining him. Guy and I are headed over to Radio The Cable, so join us there. We'll talk more lockdowns. This is Bloomberg.